I'm really just here as a person telling you what my path was and see if there's some components you can take away that may be helpful in your own situations. So I've had many titles in my career. Uh, I've been the founder and the CEO of a mental health company. I've been a managing partner of a medical supply company. I've worked in a private practice before. I've been director of business development at an acute care hospital, and the list goes on. And so as I talk to people about different things that I've done in my career, I always hear the, what was your big break? Right? How did you finally like break into it? And the reality is I would love to tell you like this is the one moment that was the defining piece that made me be able to go down this career path, but there was no real big break. It was a series of breaks, bumps, and bruises along the way that allowed me to become who I am today. So I'm gonna walk you through some of that today, and I'm gonna start shortly after high school. And so I graduated with my undergraduate degree. I went to NIU, uh, which is out in DeKalb, and back in that time, which I'm sure people still have that same perception, is once you're done, with your undergrad, like you have a degree, you're ready to be a real working professional. And so I, I moved home and I was ready for the big bucks. I was like, I'm finally done being a starving student. I'm gonna get a great professional job now that I have this shiny degree and my life's gonna be completely different. And so in the beginning, I was very picky. I would be very selective on the places I would apply to because of course I wanted the best salary I could get, the best position I could get, and the fact that I had this well-earned college degree with a high GPA, any company would be lucky to have me. And so I spent about a month being very selective on where I would apply to. And I got hardly any responses. And so that selectiveness started to change. And then I went to, okay, I'll settle for this job. Maybe I just need to apply for, you know, widen up my search into what I'm looking for. And that was about a month and I didn't get a lot of responses. And so then I got to desperation, where I'm like, okay, I need to apply for anything that's out there. I need a job. My loans are starting to kick in. I'm three months into post-graduation, and I don't have a clear career path of what's going on. So no longer is it, you know, you'd be lucky to have me. It's can I please, please come and work there, right? Completely changed my tune. Uh, I was what I call basement dweller. So after I came home from college, I moved my bedroom into the basement and that was kind of like where I stayed. And so it was almost like my lair, which was nice, but I also got no sunlight and really was probably my own little world thinking things were gonna be not exactly what they were. And I started to go through like almost bouts of depression because I'm like, I left with, a, with an insight of, or an ex expectation that I was gonna have this wonderful career that I was gonna hit the ground running with and now I'm sitting at home in, in my mom's basement as a 21-year-old not knowing what my direction was and applying to every job that I could and really not getting much of, of traction there. And I had a moment of clarity. And the moment of clarity was I needed focus. Instead of applying to every single job that I could find online, I really need to figure out what I'm doing. And that moment of clarity led me to, there's three kind of pathways that I had envisioned for myself. And I wasn't sure which one I would take. But I started to whiteboard this out and one of them was social service. Like I really like the idea of the Peace Corps and I figured this is the only time in my life that I don't have you know, major responsibilities with a mortgage and a wife and kids and everything else that I know later on in life would be much more difficult to do. And so maybe doing something like that would be a really cool initiative for me to embark on. But the Peace Corps was two years. So I was like, I don't know if I want to dedicate two years to doing this. So I looked into another component, which was called AmeriCorps, which is basically the Peace Corps here domestically, which is about a year long. And so I started really looking into that. The second was enter the job market, like get a professional position and walk right into that and be able to focus on kind of that channel of growing my career. And then the third was if I can't figure anything else out, maybe I should go back to school. Right, maybe I should get my master's and that'll help me in a more pro pro career progression perspective. And so that's where I mapped out like here are my three channels and I need to focus more on that instead of every squirrel, chasing every squirrel that comes up to try and figure out, can I get this job, can I get that job? Today I'm gonna look at this, tomorrow I'm gonna look at that. And so what I did was really focus on specific opportunities and research those opportunities and tailor everything I was doing for that opportunity. So when I was dedicated of the channel for social service, 
I really said, okay, I'm just gonna go dive deep into what this looks like, do all the research that I need to, create my resume that makes me that much more attractive for this channel, and this is gonna be my only focus. And I learned really two important lessons at that point in my life. The first was you have to pursue every opportunity as if you don't have any others, right? So that's basically super dedicating yourself into that and saying, this is what I'm gonna pursue right now and not focus on anything else because you're gonna get really far when you hyper-focus on one, com one component. And the second was multitasking made me dumb, right? And when I'm trying to do 400 things at once, one second I'm applying for this technology job, the next second I'm trying for the sales job, and then 13 minutes later I'm applying for the social service thing. After a while, you get lazy and you're using the same resume on everything that you apply for when the reality is it's probably not as applicable, right? But multitasking does that to you because all you're trying to do is get as much done as you can. And a lot of people tell you for a career, it's a numbers game. Apply to as many things as you can and hopefully you get some response back. But in my experience, it wasn't a numbers game. It really was a quality game. And if I would have just said, all right, I'm gonna focus on social service, I'm gonna tailor my resume to that, I'm gonna make connections in that area and figure out what exactly I need to do to achieve what that's going to be, that's much more fruitful than I click six buttons and I applied to 700 places today with the same resume, how come I haven't gotten a call back? So I made progress. Um, I got a, um, a posting at AmeriCorps where they said, hey, we're really interested in you coming into here. And so the channel one, I had an opportunity. Uh, channel two, I actually worked with a medical supply company that made me an offer to essentially be a delivery driver. I'd love to tell you that it was different, but when you boil down the position that they had, it was like a sales development consultant. But if you boiled it down, I was gonna be a delivery driver. I would actually go into certain manufacturers, talk to them about what they're doing from a healthcare perspective, and then look to try to get them to utilize the supplies that we were selling. And then the third was I got entry into graduate school. And so I got entry into UIC's Masters of Health Administration program. And so now I went from the basement dweller who didn't really know what he was doing, spraying and praying, hoping, hoping that something would come through into three solid opportunities that I had to figure out what am I gonna do next? Which one of these do I wanna pursue? And the only reason I got there is because I focused on each channel rather than just blindly trying to apply to everything that's available out there. So I learned my lesson. And one of those was, I always gotta be a few steps ahead. I'm not going to graduate and end up in the same position or go to AmeriCorps or start this job and then something happens in life and I'm stuck going, what do I do now, right? So I have to step my game up in planning well ahead and I probably should have done this in undergrad. Six months before graduation, I started, should have started figuring out what are my next steps once I graduate. Um, so I picked graduate school I actually moved to Chicago, uh, enrolled in UIC's program, and I knew that I wanted to be in healthcare as a field, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And most educational institutions, particularly in like a postgraduate world, they love to have you as a student, because that's revenue. Now what happens to you after you being a student is not necessarily the biggest concern for them, right? So they're structured in I'm going to teach you what you need from a base core uh, perspective, but I'm not really investing all my time and energy to figure out what kind of job you're gonna get afterwards. That's really on you. And so what I thought to myself is, hey, this is a two-year program. I'm not gonna graduate in two years and move back into my mom's basement and say, what am I doing now? I need to start working on that immediately. And if I'm gonna be in healthcare, I need to start getting into healthcare to understand it more and figure that out. So I applied to everything I could while in graduate school. And I didn't start at the top and say, I have a graduate degree, so I really need this pristine job. I was like, I'll take anything. I want my foot in the door. So I applied for places like patient transport. I applied for security, receptionist, really anybody that would take me to get my foot in the door at a hospital, because I knew that I had two years before my next inflection point where I would graduate. And I needed that exposure. I needed those connections. And so I actually got a position at Mount Sinai Hospital, which is on 15th in California on the west side of Chicago. And I worked there part-time while I was in graduate school. And the position they hired me for was a senior HR assistant. I knew nothing about HR. I was a glorified paper copier. But I was super happy to be there because I only worked there two days a week. 
And those two days a week, I got a ton of exposure of just the inside of how HR works. The real thing that came up was uh, the time that I had outside of those two days a week. So I immediately knew I needed to build connections. So two days a week, they're paying me minimum wage. And at that time, it was like $7 or something an hour. I, was, I joke with some of the folks that I still keep in touch with from there that I was paying them to work there because my lunch cost me like $6. And then parking cost me another like $16. And there's a variety of other you know, gas toll, everything else that we had. So realistically, I was paying to work there. And I worked there for those two days a week. But I didn't learn a ton in HR. I learned a little bit. But I also had three days a week that I wasn't working. So during that time, I decided I'm going to walk around and make connections here. Right? I have a badge. I can walk through the hospital now. So I started doing is going into the administrative suite and talking to different folks there. And I started actually with the receptionist because they actually know more about the hospital than anybody else really does. They know more of the ins and outs of what's happening than any of the executives actually do. And so I made a lot of really good friends there and built some solid connections. From there, I said, okay, who else should I be talking to? Who has an appetite to even talk to me in this day and age when everyone's so busy? And I found my way into my CEO's office of the hospital, and I said, hey, I really want to learn. I want to one day have a job similar to yours. I have zero experience. What can I do? And he laughed a little bit, and I told him the whole, you know, I basically pay you to work here. Is there any opportunity for me to learn? I'll do anything. And he said, sure. Of course I got extra stuff that I'd have you do. Because the lesson I learned there is most everybody is going to let you work for free. Right? And so in that opportunity, when I told the CEO, I'll do anything, he said, all right, you know, let's start out with a few small things. And obviously, these are going to be on your days off. This is uncompensated time. You're coming in to basically volunteer. Um, in exchange, you have exposure. I'm going to let you sit in on meetings. You're going to be able to learn some of the things that happen behind the scenes of a, of a hospital administration. And whatever you can glean from there is you. And so I'm doing that while I'm in graduate school learning about the methodologies and different components like uh, macroeconomics of healthcare. But then I leave and I walk into a hospital and I see what actually happens behind the closed door, which is actually more valuable than the education I'm getting in my master's program. And so I started with really just observing. I would sit in on every meeting. I said, can I take meeting notes? CEO says, great, I don't have to have my administrative assistant do this. So I sat there and just started taking notes. Afterwards, because I needed to understand the notes in order to transcribe them the right way, I would ask them questions. Why did the chief medical officer ask for this? Why did the resident say that? I don't quite understand. And he would explain it to me, and my guise was, I need to understand this so I can write the notes the right way. But in reality, I'm just feeding all this information or gaining it all as I'm learning it from them. Then from there, I went to like mundane tasks. I have all this paperwork that I need to get into an Excel document so we can analyze it. And it's all printed sheets. You know, nobody wants to do that. But I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. Right? Because now I'm the one who gets to put all this in there. And then I get to do and see what that analyzation is. And then I get to take it to him and say, is this right? And I'm an intern who's free. So what is he? he's not going to fire me. He's going to be like, no, you did it wrong. Let me show you what you're doing. And then I get to learn a whole new skill set that I otherwise didn't. So I was volunteering for every job that everyone else wouldn't make eye contact when the project came up, right? Because they didn't want to be voluntold to do it. And I was like, let me do that. Then it started with small projects. He's like, hey, you did a real good job with that analysis. Can you help me with this piece? Can you help me with that piece? By the end of the two years, I was doing work that most of the paid analysts were doing there, right? But doing it completely for free and with a level of energy that nobody else was doing it with, right? Because that was their mundane job. To me, this was my schooling times 10. And so two years passed, and a few months before graduation, I told myself, well, like, what now, right? I got all this really good experience, and now I'm going to have a much more expensive master's uh, degree, and I got to figure out what my next steps are. And I can't end up back to be a basement dweller. I got to figure out what my, what my next steps are. So I went back into Mount Sinai and I said, as I was still working there, and I said, hey, why don't you guys hire me? Like, I'm about to graduate. You yourself have told me that I do the work of one of your analysts in three days of what they do in five days. So I've basically interviewed here for the last two years. You know who I am. You know my work ethic. Hire me. I'm about to graduate. Like, I'm in the market. And uh, he said, yeah, you've done a great job, a really good job. But I don't have a job for you. 
you think I can create a position because you're graduating? Like, that's not the way business works. I can't go to my board and say, hey, look, he's done a really good job. Now we got to pay him. Because, and, and yes, he's been doing it for free, but now I need to create a new position because he's about to graduate. You think the hospital board cares about your graduation? So I appreciate what you've done 100%, but I don't have a job for you. I'm sorry to tell you that. And I was dejected a little bit, but I knew that that couldn't be my only egg in the basket. I got to figure out what are other opportunities. So I started going to career fairs. I started figuring out uh, you know, company postings, job websites, and that same CEO who told me great job but no job probably had some level of guilt in him and said, look, I'm going to introduce you to people. I can't get you a job, but I know someone at Children's. I know someone at Northwestern. And maybe they have some company postings. Now, I'm not going to walk you in and demand that they hire you, but I'll get you an interview. You got to do the work. Go find a position, see that it's open, and I'll get you the interview. From there, it's on you. You fail the interview, there's, I got, there's no influence I have to get you a position, but just getting you that interview is going to be big. He did get me a couple interviews. I interviewed at uh, Children's Hospital, which uh, was Lurie's. Um, I interviewed at Rush, and it was all based on connections that he had with other CEOs. And he said, hey, just go ahead and interview this guy. I would love to tell you that I got one of those jobs. I interviewed him, didn't get any of them. But I made some connections there. I was able to have FaceTime, have an explanation with them, talk to them, do an interview. Um, but it didn't quite work out. And the reality is not everything works out. So you've got to pursue things with the rigor of this may be the only thing, so I'm going to hyper-focus on it. And when this doesn't work, the next thing I focus on is going to be the only thing, and i got to put all my heart into it. And so I started applying at consulting jobs, hospital jobs, insurance companies, really anything in the healthcare field, because I had all this hospital experience and that I knew I wanted to work in that field. I got to a point where I started going to all these different career fairs. And one of them I went to um, was the Illinois Small College like, Placement Association. It was a random um, job fair that they had. And I looked at every employer that was coming to that job fair and none of them were really healthcare related. At that point, I was like, I'll go there just to get some more interview experience. It's like sharpening a blade, right? I'm like, let me just keep on my toes with interviewing. I'm going to go there and just take an interview. So I applied for uh, an interview with Crow Harwath, which is an accounting firm. I walked in for that interview, and in the first like 13 seconds, we both realized, like, she's like, what's your accounting background? I'm like, I took one class like three years ago. She's like, you're applying to be a staff accountant. Like, why are you in this interview? I'm like, I'm not going to lie. I'm here to really just sharpen up my interview skills. I know that I'm not a fit for the position that you're hiring for. And immediately in that moment, we both just kind of let our shoulders down. She's like, well, I have 45 minutes scheduled for you. You're definitely not getting this job. We'll just chat. So we literally just sat there chatting. She's like, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who comes to interview for a CPA job when you've taken one accounting class like four years ago? What is your mindset? And so I just started explaining it to her, and this is my journey, this is what I've been through. I came here just for the interview, and we hit it off. She's like, you're a, a very amazing person. I don't know that many people that interview for fun um, when they know that they're not going to have even a chance at this position. And she's like, I think you'll make it. And actually, I have a brother who works at a consulting company who focuses on healthcare. Do you want to talk to him? I'm like, hell yeah, I want to talk to him. Give me his phone number. And we sat there just talking, laughing, joking for the 45 minutes. And she was like, I needed this break. I'm so tired of interviewing all day. This was nice to just talk to someone and not have the pressure of, am I hiring you? We both knew in the first few minutes that there's no way you'd get this position. So she sent me uh, her, the information for her brother. I went out and just had coffee with him. And I interviewed with him and said, hey, here's my background. I'm going to tell you my story. And this is why I'm so passionate and what I want to do in healthcare." And he said, sounds great. So he told me the same thing the CEO said. I'll get you an interview. That's all I can do. Right? So I'm a director in our large healthcare consulting firm. I'll get you an interview. And the company is called Huron Consulting Group. It's a large consulting group based out of downtown. So I our, our reimbursement schedules and why he has to do that. And they got to me, and I was like, I wouldn't do any of that. I would literally look at outcome data for all three of the top surgeons there. And I would look at which one was using the tool that I wanted or the implant that I wanted. I would blind their data, and then I would show it to all three of them. And I'd say, which one do you think you are? And just their hyper-competitiveness and being a, a thoracic surgeon or orthopedic surgeon is going to be, oh, that's the one I am? How come I'm not there? 
and I would point out it's the only difference is you guys are using different devices. And by itself, he'll want to change. The guy was like, that's, that's actually the only answer I think I've heard today that would actually work. Where did you come up with that? So where did I come up with it? I spent the last two years sitting in a hospital being yelled at by physicians. Like, I've witnessed how you change behavior in the last two years. I don't learn any of that in my grad school. I learned that taking notes, watching the CEO trying to change people's minds. And so I left there, and before I got to the parking lot, they called me and said, you have a job. You're the one that we picked out of the group that we're going to give you this. I said, that's amazing. I'll take it. I accepted it, and I was on my journey. And that was my first like, real professional career that I got into. Now, the lesson I took away from there is like, what's meant to be will be. We always try to plan out, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my ACTs. I actually took my LSATs. I was going to go to law school. Things just didn't work out in the way that they were supposed to. But the reality is things worked out in the way that they were supposed to. And sometimes when you're doing it, it doesn't feel like that. And whether you're a believer in God or fate or anything else, I'm a big believer that things work out the way that they should. You are who you are. And some of that is you just accepting that I need to go through this process. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't put in the effort. If I didn't do some of these different components, I never would have ended where I've ended up. But every career path that I've seen from there has been a pursuit of some of these lessons that I've learned along the way. So my breaks taught me lessons. And the first one was pursue every opportunity as if you have no other. Right? That has to be your sole focus at that moment. Second is multitasking made me dumb. Right? I had to focus on singular things, which allowed me to really move the needle in that direction. The third was always think a few steps ahead from now, because you never want to be caught flat-footed. And most people will let you work for free. When you're young, you have the opportunity to do that, and do that as much as you can. The stuff that you will learn there, if in the right opportunity, will be more valuable than any of the educational stuff that you learn. And what's meant to be will be, right? You may not know it in the moment, but in the end, the way that it plays out is the way that it should have played out. So as a parent, what can you guys do? So the odd part is like us as parents, we have this playbook because we've been through life, right? And it's all based on our experiences. And I know when I held my daughter and my son when they were born, like the thoughts ran through my head. I just want to hand you my playbook. I want you to not step in the same puddles as I did. And where I see a puddle ahead of you, I want to be able to block that from you so you don't have to get your feet wet. Because I've been through this life. And later in life, I realized the value of that, but I also realized that it's very cyclical. Like, I was talking to a friend of mine who is really struggling with his uh, teenager. He's like, everything I tell him, he's always rebelling against me. No matter what it is. If I say sky's blue, no, it's actually tinted green. Right? Tell him the grass is green. Well, it seems a little bluish today. He's like, and I don't understand. If I tell him to go left, he's got to go right. I said, yeah, that, that's really interesting. What were you like at his age? He's like, I wasn't like that. I said, you weren't like that? Your parents lived in India, and you, you, you left not just the city. You left the continent and moved over here to start a new life. Right? So you may not think that you were rebellious, but you were rebellious in your own way. And that's what's going to happen right now with your child who's trying to find his own way. And guess what? 20 years from now, it's going to happen with his kid. And he's going to look and say, why is my kid acting this way? That is the cycle of the way humans just work. You get to a certain age and you start to push back. And you start to figure out, I need to figure out this world on my own. And the one person who all they want to do is help you becomes the one person you don't want to listen to. Until you get older and you look back and go, damn, everything they said makes sense. I wish I would have listened. Everyone has that moment in their life where they look back and go, oh, that's what they're trying to tell me. And every generation looks at their parents and say, you just don't understand. We did that. Right? We, I, my parents came here in the early 70s, and I looked at them and said, you guys don't get it. I'm, I'm born here. It's a whole different scenario. And my kids are going to grow up and look at me and go, you don't get it. You grew up in the 80s and the 90s. You don't have the technology that we do. And their kids are going to look at them and say, you don't understand what we go through. Things were different when you grew up. Every generation from the history of generations has been through this. Things will never stay the same for 20, 30 years. And so some are monumental shifts, 
but if you talk to the youth generation of any generation, they'll feel, they'll feel disconnected from their parents' generation, particularly in those adolescent years, because to them, it's a gigantic leap. Sometimes the same message delivered by someone else is much more impactful than the message delivered by you. That was one of the things I was, I was talking to my friend about, is like, everything you're saying is right, but because you're the parent, they're not going to listen to it. And so if they hear that message from others, for some odd reason, it like sinks in so much more. And that's frustrating as a parent. I mean, it's frustrating as a husband. I know there are times where I'm talking to my wife and her sister will tell her like, I think you should do this. And I'm like, and she's like, it's a great idea. I'm like, wait, I've said that 17 times and you haven't listened to it. And your sister says it once and it's a great idea. But the reality is sometimes you just need to hear it from someone else. And it clicks for whatever reason that may be. And that's very transparent with our adolescents. And I kind of already went through this. This is a cycle. What you're going through, your kids are going to go through and guarantee you your parents went through with you. So these are my kids right now. This is a picture taken about a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, and here are some of the things that I'm going to try to do. And again, I'm not a parenting expert. This is my lived experience that I'm sharing with you guys and what I've told myself, my wife and I have discussed, what we're going to try to do as a strategy for our kids. One is don't push them into decisions. Because we're always trying to guide our kids, but that, there's a th thin line between guiding and pushing. And I think we as parents have a tendency to want to push them in the direction that we feel is best for them. But when you do it in a way that is overexerting, you end up creating a divide that breaks down that trust barrier between you guys. And so some of this is letting them explore. Guide them by your actions louder than your words. Because what I notice, at least with my two little ones, I can tell them, eat all your food on your plate. And they may not want to do it. And what I realize is if they watch me do the same thing, no matter how many times I tell them to do something, it's not impactful. But like my son, who's five years old now, will watch me brush my teeth and I'll look over to him and he will mimic the moves that I'm doing. Now, I could tell him to brush his teeth in a certain way, but that's not as impactful as him watching me do it. So everything that we say and want for our kids, you model it, that's much more effective than just telling them this is what I want you to do. And it's particularly more effective when they're younger, right? Because they're very trying to figure out the rules of the road, so to speak. We spend more time at work than anywhere else. And the reason I say this is because Oftentimes, we try to push our kids into a particular field or a particular position because we think that's what's going to be best for them. And some of that is based on our own lived experiences or what we've heard from our social, uh, our social network um, or w what we've seen, which may have changed from our generation to the next generation. There was no TikTok growing up. There were no social media influencers that we had. And so the idea that someone makes a living that is, makes a very good living doing that is like you know, uh, abstract to us. Not to say that it's not right, it's different. The world has changed, and I'm sure in 15 years, by the time my kids are trying to figure out what they're doing, the world will change. And so if you spend more time at work than anywhere else, allow your kids to figure out what they like, what they're good at. And it may be something that you've never even heard of before or that you've never thought would be a good career for them. But think about their happiness, which as a parent, really is your ultimate goal is for your kid to live a happy life. I mean, that's why we want them to be in a certain career, because we want them to live a happy life, have a stable financial life, and that's what most of us push for. But the reality is if they're in a great career where they make good money, but they hate their work, I would trade that in for someone who doesn't make as much, but is really happy with what they do, because that happiness you can't get back. In the next slide, I compiled a few things that I plan to do with my kids. One is think about their skills and talents. So do some type of self-assessment. There uh, there's a couple self-assessments that are out there. One that I really like is called Strength Finders. And you go through that, and it basically tells you what you're really good at. And the idea behind Strength Finders is don't go pursue a career at the things you're already naturally good at, because you'll be really good at that career. And now figuring out what you're really good at is something like strength finders. You can go through that and do a self-assessment, fill out the questionnaire, and it tells you these are the things that I'm really good at. Consider your daily responsibilities. So in any career, what, do you, what does that person do? Right, so if they go into that field, what does their normal day look like? And that's some of what I'll talk to my kids about. Is like You may have an idea of what being a pilot looks like. 
but what does the day-to-day -day actually look like in being a pilot? Determine your financial aspirations. Right? So if you're like, hey, I want to live in a $30 million home, but I want to be an art teacher. Like, I need to have a real conversation with you about the reality of what art teachers make. Now, I don't want to tell you that you can't achieve your dream, but I want you to know if you have a particular financial aspiration, like, how are you going to get there? Because what I see a lot of people do is they pursue a career in a particular area, they end up graduating, and then when they start getting job offers, it's like this drastic shock of like, this is, a, this is only how much I'm going to get paid? And what I would love to say in those conversations is like, you didn't look this up before you picked a major? Like you didn't even think about what life looks like after this is done? The reality is a lot of people don't. They're not prepared for that. They just think this is what I'm passionate, this is what I'm gonna do. So right setting those expectations. Consider your work style. Some things are very independent. Some folks like to work remotely. You know, I have a friend who's a, a software developer. He hates human interaction. It's like I wanna work at home at my desk and do what I need to do. I have other folks who are in sales. COVID was horrible for them. Not having human interaction was like torture. And so looking at your child and figuring out like, what kind of personality are you? What, do you, what will you, environment will you thrive in? That's the component there. Um, deciding to undergo training or pursuing a degree. This is not a very popular statement. And I, I, I'm sure some people will say, I don't understand why you'd feel that way. I have two master's degrees. If my kids are not going to go into a field that requires a master's degree, I'm going to tell them don't waste the money. Because there are a lot of things that you can do today that you don't necessarily need that additional amount of degree. My degrees now are one line on my resume. No one asks about them, no one cares about them. They care about what I did at my last job. They care about what positions I've held. They care about what kind of budget I can manage. Those are the components that people actually care about. Now, that being said, there are things that you have to have a degree for. I can't be very passionate about building and tomorrow decide to be an engineer. My wife's an attorney. I can't walk into a courtroom and say, hey, I'm, I'm ready to represent people. Right? I can't be a physician without a license. There are certain components you have to get that degree. There are other things that, from a hospital management perspective, at one point they looked around and said, hey, we want everyone in administration to have a master's degree. So in that component, you may need it to open a door, but it's not necessarily what's going to get you the job in a lot of fields. The last piece, or the next piece, I think is really the most, the, the most important, which is why I have it bolded, gain experience. I never would have got my job if I didn't work part-time at Mount Sinai Hospital. I, I, I wouldn't have got that if I didn't go door knocking trying to get a, a job doing anything at a hospital. And the experience that I gained there has been more valuable than any schooling I've done. And so everyone's going to let you work for free, most people will, gain that experience. That is more valuable than anything else you will gain. And put yourself in those positions to be able to do that. Find a career coach or mentor. I've had many throughout my career. Folks that can say, I've done this. I've walked this path. Here's what you should do. Here's how you should handle it. One of the things I wasn't prepared for is when you get into, the, at least in the hospital world, and I'm sure this happens in almost every industry, the social politics of work. They don't teach you that in, master's, in, in a master's program. And every workplace, because it is inherently social and you have inherently have relationships, every place has politics. But there is no course on how to navigate those politics. I lean on my mentors for that. I would often talk to them and be like, hey, I'm having a problem with this particular person. Now, I'm having a problem with them. We're both going to do our job, but it is like I dread having even a conversation with them because we're constantly butting heads. What am I supposed to do? I go and tell their superior every time this happens, right? Do I just stop working with them? I can't do that. How do I get the job done? And I had to really work with my mentors to be like, okay, how do I turn that aggressive relationship we have into one that's more collaborative? And that's where mentors can really help and say, I've done that before. I swam in that pool. Some people you're going to mesh with, some you won't. How do you figure out how to find middle ground to move forward in a way that's best for the company and really best for you? Otherwise, it's going to be super stressful. Increase your professional network. I'd say, um, this is a statistic I'm randomly making up in my head, but nine out of 10 jobs that are not technical specific are probably got because you know someone. Even this day and age with, with such a um, staffing shortage, millions of resumes go out every day. Most HR departments don't view your resume. They have keyword searching software that they pull out different things for. 
but someone walks in and hands a resume down on a desk and says, hey, give this guy a call, I know him, that's top of the pile. So professional network is really important to have. Some of that is volunteering, right? That same CEO walked me into three meetings. Granted, I didn't get it, but I met with three CEOs that I otherwise would have applied for. They wouldn't even have looked at my resume. So having that professional network is really important. With that, I want to ask what questions you guys have. Yeah, I mean, and that was probably one of the most pivotal components of me gaining experience. I think the hard part is people have a fallacy that like, and honestly, some places are just set up horribly. I was in a good position where I could walk in and say, can I learn? And he knew I was there to learn. So he had me do the grunt work, but then I also learned. A lot of places are set up, come in here, and all you're doing is grunt work, right? So if all you do is come in and file papers and you learn nothing, then you, it's not very valuable for that person to be there. So I think being clear on expectations when you come in to say, look, I'll do 50% of filing or stuffing envelopes, but I'm here to learn. So what can you teach me in the other time that I'm not here? And I think if you can do that, a lot of people will respect that honesty and say, well, I need help with the grunt work, which is why I'm taking on this unpaid intern component. But sure, I can teach you stuff. Uh, we did that when I worked at the hospital. We'd have folks come in and we'd have them in the marketing department, we'd have them stuff envelopes. And so they'd stuff envelopes for a day or two, and the other two days we'd have them sit in on meetings. Come and see what an actual meeting looks like, what we're actually discussing. And that's stuff that, if you take it seriously enough, I think the other hard part is at the high school age, most of them aren't taking it that seriously at that point. And so for me, I didn't take it seriously until I was at, after undergrad. I didn't take it seriously in high school, didn't take it seriously in undergrad, I didn't take it seriously until I was in grad school and I was terrified of moving back in my mom's basement. And I'm like, all right, I need the experience. This is the way I'm going to get it. Because I applied every other place, and I can't get a patient transport job. They want to let me mop the floors. So I'm like, how do I get in here? This is how I'm going to do it. And that's how I ended up getting more experience. So I feel like even just having that conversation with high schoolers to say, you may not be ready there, but if you are, and this is something you want to do, pursue it and present it in this way. Right? Walk into a business, talk to your parents, friends, Figure out, you know, people either know your character or need additional help. If you're very passionate about business, find a lawn care business. Say, hey, I'll mow for you two days a week. And the other time, I want to be in the office to learn how you market to clients. How do you guys do your inventory? How do you take care of your machines? Because maybe one day I want to open a business like this. A lot of the stuff I learned, even in HR, uh, I didn't end up in a career in HR, but a lot of things are very applicable. Right. In HR, I could see how do you deliver a very difficult message to someone. Right. Legally, what can you and can't you say? And so there's some components to that. Emotionally, how do you work with people? So I took out components of that and was like, all right, I learned this, this, and this. That stayed with me, your transferable skills. I think same thing with some folks that can get a lot of transferable skills. They just may not see that opportunity. So I think some of that is just showing them that light. And the question is whether or not they're ready to see it. Great question. The reality is some people are just going to have that. They're not a good fit, yeah. right? So if someone's like, hey, I don't want to teach you anything, no matter how much you try, they're not going to be a good teacher. Yeah. you got to roll to the next one. And when you go to the next one, I think the other thing that a lot of people find difficult to do or they don't understand, like I'm a business owner right now. Every time I give one of these presentations, I probably have seven parents who email me and say, hey, I want my kid to come learn from you. And the reality is I don't have time. I don't. And so what I say to them is like, have him provide me some value, and then I'll think about it. When I went to the CEO, I was already working there. I said, let me do your filing. You start with providing someone value, then you ask. The problem in our society is we ask first, and we expect to have it. And the reality is most people, I, I'm under no obligation to take time out of my busy day to figure out how to teach you, and you may not even take this seriously. What am I doing this for? And so I think with a lot of people, that's what I try to instill if I have a conversation. If I really want something, what am I doing for you first? Let me show you that I have value. So even with the person who's hesitant to show you, let's say he has a business, he doesn't want to show you his trade secrets, say, hey, I'm really interested in this. I just want to look. What can I do for you? What are things that are mundane that you don't like to do? Can I start there? And that's hard for someone to be like, you know, I don't want you to move my carpet from here to there, or you know, file these papers, or do a mailer, or whatever it might be. 
Because then I'm providing you value. It's much easier when I do that for me to then come to you and say, hey, can you show me this? I'm interested in that. So that'd be my advice is start first. I mean, all of us probably have the same thing. You have someone who asks you for help. I always find it odd when you don't talk to someone for like, you know, three years and the first thing they send you on LinkedIn is like, can you get me a job here? Like, I worked with you for two weeks, three years ago. I have no idea. No, I'm not going to go and try it and take time out of my day and try to figure out how to get you a position here. Right? But that same person who's helped me out in the past and I needed something or can you help me with a letter of recommendation or do you know someone I can call at this company? A lot of people have asked me before, this has been, I'm thinking about things that work on me. So one of the things that's worked on me is people have asked me, can I take you to lunch and just pick your brain? I'm not asking you for anything. I don't want a job. I don't want a sales pitch. I am literally just want like 25 minutes of your, of your brain. That's much easier for me to say yes to than a, I want a career here. I want to figure this out. I want to learn your business. I want blah, blah, blah. Because the reality is all of us are just way too busy. And we live in a super packed schedule world where we're always like, I just don't have time. There's always something falling off my plate. Am I going to go spend extra time doing this? Probably not. But someone who's like, hey, I want your advice. I just want to sit with you, pick your brain for a little bit. I can make time for that. Definitely. Good question. Any others? No? Was this helpful for you guys? Yeah? Awesome. Well, thank you so much.